What's up, everybody? <laughs> Happy Monday to everybody. I hope everybody's Good having night. a wonderful Monday. Um, this is Real Talk Chronicles. I'm your host, Bill Forster, with my co-host, Dr. Marilyn Quarter. And this is Real Talk with the Doctor today. We got a good panel today with us, and we got some good conversations that we're going to have. But first and foremost, I want to tell everybody how you can, if you're watching from YouTube, subscribe to it like always. If you're watching from Facebook, share it. You can go under my name and share it, and that way you can see it. Uh, ask the panel always to turn your phones down. With that being said, I got to mention our sponsors. We have uh, Deli Arts Magazine. We have Melba's. She's opening up a new restaurant. We have Leon Ellis, Chocolat. And we have, of course, Soft Illusions, my wife. That's just a beautiful thing. Stefania, what's going on? TJ, I see you all. Uh, thank you, everybody, for chiming in, coming in, the people that will be coming in. Today, like I said, first and foremost, let me say hello to um, the ladies. Happy Women's Month. Uh, I appreciate you. For all that you Thank ladies you. do in this world. And Thank Doc, I have to give you, you know, I missed you, but um for Black History Month, your 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 resume is impeccable and all that you've done, you need to be celebrated, especially that you're my cousin. <laughs> I'm more proud to to celebrate you for Black History Month. Um with Thank that being said, tonight there's so much going on in the world. Uh what's up, Vera? There's so much going on in the world with violence yeah. and a lot of people are stemming it to mental illness. I'm not saying it isn't, I'm not saying it is, but I figured we would delve into that mental illness conversation. And with that being said, I wanna introduce my panel and I want them to give their background. First and foremost, I have Miss Lisa Whiteside. Hello, Lisa. Hello, how how are you? How's everyone? Um, I'm Lisa, Lisa White. I'm yes. um, retired. retired from New York City Department of Corrections. I retired 17 years ago. Um, shortly after retiring, or actually before I fully retired, I went into academics. I've taught criminal justice. Um, at Monroe College, at Post University, at SUNY Empire, at Westchester Community, at quite a number of schools. Um, I've also served as the chairperson for the School of Criminal Justice at Monroe College. Um, I was also the chairperson at Post University for the sociology and criminal justice programs. Uh, and my most current position was as the director for a bail project that operated out of the five boroughs where bail provided for individuals who could not afford it as long as the bail did not exceed $1,000. And um, we provided case management to those individuals. It was strictly voluntary. There were no mandates attached to it. So we would bail people out and um, they would not get involved with the case management or wraparound services that we were prepared to provide them with. Um, I just wanted to make a note because I did speak about it last week that well, most of the individuals that we did provide bail for, um, they, the, the cases were domestic related. It was considered to be in some violence um, issues. So um, I thought that was noteworthy because um, it was just interesting how many people have relational issues. And one of my goals was to work with um, our clients uh, regarding relational matters as well as with the victims. Well, awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you. And with last but not least, I got my boy, my college ball brother, my man, Mr. Norman Davis. Norman, let him know your credentials. In, and um, Norman has a story. If he wants to divulge it later, we can talk about it. But from a, uh, another standpoint, Norman, tell him what you uh, you did for your career, please. Yes, good evening. Uh, 
law enforcement, all aspects from uh, sheriff to federal. Uh, I retired, medically retired in 2015 from doing state and federal re-entry. Thank you. Now, with that being said, like I said, right now, mental illness has been paramount in the news all over the world, not just New York, any other place. So crime, a lot of people have, are, are equating the crime to the mental illness. And I'm not saying some are not responsible. I'm not saying mental illness is not responsible for some of the crimes. Last, last week, we had a, a, a nice panel of correction officers on, and we got into the discussion of, of mental illness and Lisa had a, a certain stance, and we can bring it up later. But I figured, let's talk about that. So, Doc, it's yep. always a pleasure, of course. Break down what mental illness is for the people that really think they know but don't know. Let's, let's, let's go by the numbers, please. So let me first say that for 10 years, I was the medical director for juvenile corrections here in Washington, D.C. Right. After I did my residency in pediatrics at Howard, I did something called adolescent medicine. And what I always tell folks is that, you know, it we all can be crazy or it, it doesn't take much. And, you know, it's a thin line. However, when we talk about mental illness, you're talking about a mind that is a part of it is not socially acceptable, but also have um, issues with stress factors, don't know how to accept and deal with it and therefore inappropriate behavior, be it criminal, um, be it self-destructive. You know, we just recently had here, as well as in, D in New York, somebody going around killing the homeless. Right, right. And when you talk to the homeless, many of them right. just kind of, I, I call them, they, they just kind of stepped out of, 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 of reality or of their norm because they just couldn't take it anymore. So many of them have illnesses is where I'm going with that. And they just said, I'm dropping the mic. You know, be it corporate uh, uh, workers, uh, you know, some people who just couldn't deal depending upon what their situation was and, you know, getting evicted. So there's things that life circumstances and different events can trigger who you thought or as they thought was not mentally ill, become mentally ill. And often what we always say, you know, even on as I teach for for the schools, but also as I talk to many teachers and and, and uh, social workers and people who deal with folks who are not, quote, unquote, who, who, who have mental illnesses, it's always, it's something in their behavior, in their background. It doesn't have to be genetic, but sometimes it is. And they just crack. You know, people say, oh, yeah, they cracked up. They had a mental problem. But things were there, signs were there. And they just had one more thing, one thing too many, and then that's it. And then often they will go and on a rampage of killing, um, self-destructive, suicidal, or just don't give a dag on and just do whatever. Um, so unfortunately, we as a society, we're not sensitive to it enough. And I know in the medical field, if you're having problems mentally, you're really not going to be fit medically. And now we blend it all together. Fit medically meaning you're diabetic, okay, but you're schizophrenic or you're so depressed that you don't even want to get up, let alone check your glucose, let alone take your medicine, let alone even care. So I just wanted to bring all of that into the discussion because the understanding and the world is not, the parents are not, the teachers are not. And, you know, we can go to church, we go to church. We, well, we haven't been in church in a year or two because of the pandemic, but, but, Praying on it is fine, but we have to make sure professionally, as as your panel, as Lisa and the rest, professionally, we must we must address it, and then stop, and then take the stigma out of it, because anybody can go crazy. You stress yeah. them enough, it's like a rubber band, a rubber band. After a while, it's gonna pop. Okay, and I'm glad you said that because I think from last week as we were discussing, I'm and and. and naive if i even say that on my part when we started talking about crimes and people committing crimes so uh, correct me and, and enlighten me doc 
I understand the person that has shown signs as a child, as you stated, Lisa and Norm has stated, you know, you're working with adolescents and, and I've done mentoring programs and I've taught in schools and stuff like that, but never to the degree of anybody here. But I'm, I was always under the pressure that a person doesn't flip. He, he may have showed the signs. Like I, I feel that a lot of people today are doing crimes and then claiming mental illness. Like, oh, okay, don't, they don't want to, um, you don't want to do certain kind of time. So wait a minute, you know, you're, you're throwing feces in, in, in a woman's face. I feel that's premeditated. You, you decided to take your feces, put it in a bag, and then go on the train, and you, you picked out who you wanted. This was the discussion Lisa and I was having last week, and you saw a woman. You may not throw it in Norman's face. Norman is 6'8". You're not throwing it in my face. I'm six feet. But the bottom line is you picked your poison. I feel a lot of times with mental with people doing things, they're throwing it under mental illness. So enlighten me and educate me. Can mental illness be something that happens of the short time? I understand the rubber band theory, but is it something that people that have have shown signs for all their life and then they pop? Or is this something that can happen? Like, okay, today, Bill all of a sudden just goes a different way. Please, thank you. <laughs> well, let me just say, um, it's hit different degrees for sure. And and some some people have their, what we call bipolar, their blue days, their not so sad days, and their sunshine days. Right. All right. Now we know also the studies have shown that females in corrections detained and, 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 and committed, 80% of their crimes was committed during their menses, during their hormone, during, during their cycle. All right, right. right. We all, so, so it's like, don't mess with me. So mm -hmm. it can be physiological to a point, as well as whatever's going on in that person's mind in that at that particular time. Mm -hmm. They lost their job, um, the, you know, the dog died, their their best friend died. They, uh, they found out the best the, the girl is cheating on best friend. Oh, everything on them, and yet they could have a moment of insanity. Not to say they were insane the whole all of their life. So it could be episodic. It could be something that just continued to perk perk percolate until it it really a volcano eruption type of thing. So so, but it's something that we need to continue to address because people don't see it and and you know there's a commercial that i play on my show that somebody asks how are you doing and you know as we say and as we ask often not really listening so the, the person responds I, I have a bad day i'm really sad i'm really depressed so the other person i know what to say they're like oh, well, well for real or isn't it weather nice you know just kind of mm -hmm. avoid it avoid it and then next thing you know that person is shooting up to school or found shot in their room, suicidal. So we have to listen. We have to allow that person to tell us how they're feeling. Mm, okay. Um, Lisa, you were in um, corrections. Norm was in law enforcement. Lisa, what's your take on a lot of the things when, when you're dealing with people that are mentally ill, when they come into corrections, when you get them from law, from NYPD to corrections, how, how, how do you guys handle them? Within, when, once they're incarcerated? Well, in, initially, uh, they're seen by mental, well, not mental, by medical. And so the medical staff does the first um, assessment to determine if, in fact, they believe that the individual should be seen by mental health professionals. So once that's determined, then that information is sent to uniform personnel, but only very generalized because they can't share all the specificities, not uniform personnel would even know what, um, what all of the lingo regarding psychiatric care or mental health care would um, encompass. But if the person is really having a serious mental health issue, they're placed in specialized housing and they have something called a watch sheet where the officer is responsible 
for observing that person every 30 minutes to ensure that they don't commit suicide because with the mentally ill population, they have a higher propensity to commit suicide. Um, the jails also hire other inmates to serve as suicide aides. So those inmates, they're working a little more closely with the person who's in, I've been identified as needing mental health care. So there's that watch sheet for the officers and then there's the mental, um, the suicide aides, they call them, that also watch over those individuals who have a higher level need of mental health care. Um, clearly, they don't put those individuals in celled areas because you don't want to isolate someone who has um, mental health issues, right? Because again, the, the goal is to you know, try to make sure that they're going to get some level of stabilized care, in addition to making sure that um, they're not going to commit suicide. Mm, so, thank you, thank you. Now, Norm, you 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 come yes, from from different perspectives in dealing with them, trying to help, and then also having a certain situation in regards to your own personal. If you want to share that, I appreciate it because the bottom line is I've known you since we were 18 years old. And like I said, when we got reconnected to find out what you were going through, I felt like I wasn't there for you and we've stayed connected ever since that. But the bottom line is, can you tell me a part of where that happened in your life and um, what you, you know, and deal, you can deal it from a, a job perspective and you can deal it from a personal. Whichever way you want to go, brother, I'll let you. I'll let you take it from there. It it all coincides, from job to personal, because you know, as as someone in law enforcement, Bill, that we do have a mental illness because we've run towards gunshots. We don't run away from them. Okay. And that all takes right. a, that takes a special person to do that, you know. Um, and then the stress of the job. You know, the stress of the job, the stress of being away. I don't know how New York is, but down here, we do, we do 12 hour shifts. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you, you, you're spending 12 hours in a patrol car. You're spending 12 hours walking the beat. You're doing different things and you're not eating right. You're not sleeping right. You know, you're not taking care of your health mm -hmm. and your mental health suffers. Now, for me, you know, when 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 I got shot, when I got shot, I, it was like, you know, it, it, thank God I had on the vest, but you know, that still hurt. Right, right, right. You know, and, and that that does something to you too. You know, that does something to your mental. But for me, from everything that was going on, from me losing my leg, from me having health issues, um. It, it just got to me. It just got to be a lot for me mentally. And the mind is the fragile thing on the body. Uh -huh. That's the most fragile part of the body is the mind. So when I went through my little episode uh, and I shared it with you, and I'm not ashamed to share it, my wife can, had left. Can, go ahead, please. Enlighten people, please. I want people to hear this. Yes. My wife had left to take care of her mother because when I lost my leg, her mother had a stroke. So she was taking care of her mother. So she left. I went and got in the shower, washed up real good, got in the bed, put a plastic bag over my head, and I pulled the trigger. But the gun didn't fire. So I'm looking at it like, what the hell is going on? I know it's a good gun because, hey, it's my backup. Right, right. I pulled the trigger two more times. So three times the gun didn't fire. But yet when I took it outside in the backyard, Oh, she went off. Mm. You know, she she fired no problem. So it was at the point, I don't know why I got to that point. Because I was I, I, I did it myself. And when you suicidal, you homicidal. It goes hand in hand. Because I thought about all the people I said, damn, if I'm gonna go out, let me take the take these people that wronged me. Right, 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 right. But then I was like, you know, I didn't feel like being bothered. And after I tried it, 
I was like, you know, it's not my time. To, it's not my time. Right. right. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know. You know, people pray to different gods or whatever, but whoever you pray to, whoever you, 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 you get your strength from, I, I believe in that. Mm. It wasn't my time. I appreciate and, that story. Yeah. Go ahead, please. I'll continue. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, and as far as mental health in the, in the prison system and, and law enforcement, we used to have a big problem during the colder months, the winter months, where homeless people that had mental illness would do petty crimes to get locked up. And then they'll overcrowd the jail. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like they mm -hmm. said, three hots in a cot. But it is not, it's not, mm -hmm. I blame the polit the politicians because when crack hit, crack hit the scene, it wasn't an issue. But as soon as opioids hit the scene, it's a, pen, it, it, it's a crisis. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with mental health. That's a crisis. Some people don't even know they're crazy. Some right. Some people don't right. know it because they've been, so, they've been so used to doing it that it's become the norm to them. You know, uh, yeah. two crazy people having a conversation, they're not going to know that. You know, like the doctor said, people need to tell you, because if I said, if you say, how you doing today? I'm okay. No, you're not. No, you're not. How you doing today? Man, you know, I had a flat tire in my mind. My shoe busted. Uh, how you doing? That that that's what people want to know. If they really care about you, they ask you how you doing for a reason. Right, right. And and people got to be more open. But I, I blame the politicians for not putting the money into stuff like mental health, education. Wow. Law enforcement. I, wow, that's the because. No, continue. I'm sorry. I just go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, because it's gonna it's. It doesn't bother them until it's home. Right, right. Like you, you said, know, in regards to, me. to the dope, to, to the opium and stuff like that. Let me just read some comments, Norm. I, I appreciate you for sharing that bro that story. You know, you and I have conversed on the phone with that. I want to bring the doc back in, but it it, it it touches my heart to hear that story. And like I said, I told you, once you told me that story, I said, you got me for the rest of your life. We'll never lose touch again. And I really mean that, and I and I, and I appreciate you sharing that. Let, let, me say, let me say this before you read the read the comments. Mm -hmm. That's what you need in your corner is a strong support group of true friends. Mm -hmm. You know, blood don't make us family. Right, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. I always say that blood don't make us family. Loyalty does. Yeah. And the loyalty's been day one with you. You know, so I consider you family. Your family is my family. Absolutely. You know, um, I always told you, if you ever come this way, my door is always open. Absolutely. Vice versa. That's what we're going to do. And let me just read something. My man, Earl, my childhood friend, uh, we grew up together, grammar school. He said, mental illness is usually a lifelong condition, bipolar, schizophrenia, multiple personalities, etc. He also says, it may be suddenly diagnosed, but not suddenly, suddenly appeared. He also says, he said, evaluation must be done before labeling any individual and extensive, extensively done. Uh, Earl, he's, and I'm glad, I should have had you go on the show too, Earl, I'm glad you're here. He said, I'm a special ed schools, we deal, in special ed schools, we deal with mental illness as a way as autism, depression, homelessness, et cetera. Wow, next time, Earl, I'm gonna have to bring you in on that. So Doc, bring, uh, I'll bring you back with this. You know, listening and hearing the story, what, what, what's your take? What are you feeling on that? You know, a lot of, well, first of all, nice to meet you, Norm. And that gun didn't go off for a reason because you have too much and so much still to give and contribute. I think that what he was going through, as well as many people in, in, and frontline, I mean, we hear about docs committing suicide and just, you know, the stress, what we see, what we have to deal with, life and death all the time, police officers, law enforcement, firefighters. I mean, it's it's just a lot. And after a while, it depends on, again, how your outlets are. So it doesn't surprise me. I have colleagues who have killed themselves. And, you know, I hear about different folks in different professions. And I just, as I said, it's like the rubber band. I mean, after a while, there's nothing that it doesn't give anymore. I agree with the last, well, the person that just made a comment. You know, I also deal with ADHD and autism, uh, bipolar. 
and you can see even as a young person and you know when they're small you can see where their frustration levels they often if they're frustrated they can't deal with disappointments changes um adjust they can't adjust and life is about that and it's certainly something that you really want to make sure that as you teach folks as you're training folks that they life sucks you know life happens and you have to make sure that that moment that you feel i just can't go on any longer will be something 10 days later it wasn't all that bad but you got to get to the 10 days later so the mentor the life coaching the friends you everyone should have somebody three or four people they can call because sometimes you call somebody they're on the zoom they're busy but that that can call before they make that decision or before they pretty much feel like who cares i'm going to check out um the, the, the we're not as sensitive as we need to be and i don't know if we were sensitive 10 years ago i just know right now we're not and we're that we need we need as a culture make sure we stop and we begin to stop blaming folks and looking down and not addressing it and stop you know it's, it's a stigma so we have to destigmatize it before because many some folks are on drugs you don't know it you know they they're taking it and taking it and next thing you know they overdose they're dead um or or you know or they're trying to they're trying to deal with their pain by narcotics by alcohol because they just can't deal so if they are coming out of whatever that high is and then they're thinking about what's going on you know again about to be evicted or don't have a job or relationship issues kids are running them up then it's like okay well let me just get high again so i won't have to deal with it wow Everybody excuse here. me for one minute oh, oh, please yeah mm -hmm. um one thing that i do notice is that we as black men a lot of us don't have have men to emulate so we don't know how to how to control our anger how to how to express ourselves and we as black men a lot of us don't get the help we need medically or mentally and i mm -hmm. I, I saw that and even for myself until i until like until things happen i wasn't going to the doctor every six months or when i needed to go i was going because every year you got to go for the job every year you got to go to get recertified so I was doing it like that, but mental health is real. And, yeah. and we need to be able to, as a culture, we need to be able to say, we need help. We need help. But I don't want to go to a doctor that's like, take this pill. Right. You know, and I see a lot of pill pushing doctors. Yeah. And that's not the answer to everything. You know, I because I know in prison, in prison, they become wards of the state. So the pharmaceutical company used them as guinea as guinea pigs. Huh? The wards of the state, so they have no say. So what they eat, medical providers, vision, vision, none of that. And, and so when they come out of prison, a lot of Maori are, are institutionalized where they don't know how to readjust to society. You know, so it, it's, it's something that that we, I mean. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if it, it, it ever will be a solution, but we need to, the government need to be more open to putting money into things that are relevant to our society. You know, um, I'd rather have mental health issues taken care of than the gas prices. Right. Wow. 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 You know, I mean, yeah, we need to, we need, you know, we need gas, but we need mental health more, especially in our schools, especially in our schools at a young age. Because when, when I was growing up, we got, we got beatings, we got whoopings, we got ass whoopings. Yeah. You know, absolutely. and there was nothing wrong with us. Right. These kids nowadays, these kids nowadays don't even, you got to threaten them. A punishment to them is going outside. Mm -hmm. or, or taking it, taking it, taking the internet. Yep. Taking the internet, turning the internet off. And now the kids know that they have it where they can tell you, the parent, 
what they're not going to do. Wow. And, and, you know, it starts in the home. Right. It starts in the home. I told my sons, I said, you know, I, I apologize to you because I didn't have a father to show me how to raise you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going by trial and error, learning on the job. Yes. You know, and I know that messed them up because it messed me up not not being able to talk to my sons. Other than when you go, when you deal with police, I had to give them that lecture. You know, mm -hmm. I got 128 and 120. And you give them that lecture. When you when the police stop you, you know, this is what you do. Hold on, no. And, and it, it bothers yeah. Hold on, no. Let, let me, I'm going to let the doc uh, reply to what you were talking about, and then I'm going to bring Lisa in and, to, and, and, and get her comments on it. So go ahead, doc, because, I mean, Norm, you covered a lot of things, and I appreciate that. Uh, just the comments from people are thanking you. Angel Ray is in the building. She'll be here next week uh, with uh, Allison Williams, and we'll be talking about MS, and Allison will be back to talk about her recovery from what she went to and being in a stroke. So please chime in for that. Earl, he said, he said, however, medicine is a lot of times necessary. Unfortunately, the type you take, the dosage and the frequency plays a part. He also said mental therapy, medicine, counseling are essential to a lot of individuals well-being. He said, there are no uh, parenting manuals, bro. Trial and error. Uh, everybody is giving you accolades, Norm. Uh, also, Vera, I saw your, your comment. I just want to go back to it real quick. Uh, where was that? Uh, Vera says, she said, we have a lot of sense of balance during the pandemic. Everyone cannot handle the social isolation that we have been through these last two years. Family is so important. Tawana Scott said family is important. A lot of people, I see you, Kendra, Deborah, uh, Star. Let's go ahead, Doc, and then Lisa, you can follow in after Doc. You know, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, Norm put out a great point, and we talk about it often, and Black men don't, they don't go to the doctor. Um, sometimes they're afraid of what they may hear or they just, just don't. And unfortunately they have to keep it, you know, the lid on and, you know, until something is brewing where they have hypertension, have stroke or what have you. Unfortunately, the health system does, is, doesn't, well, it's not so friendly to black men as well. So the access, ability, the services, as well as you just don't go. I'm going to tell you a story really quickly. So many men, including, I mean, educated, not educated, they just don't go. You know, you got to push them to go, even doctors. Well, this guy who worked in our hospital, respiratory therapist, worked and worked to work. And he, um, actually, he was an anesthetist. Anesthetist, that's the people put to sleep. So he and his wife had a divorce. They had two children. She was fighting for child support, et cetera. He ended up getting a girlfriend. Um, who after a while was got pregnant and then they had a little argument, fight, what have you. And she's began to tell him, well, I'm not going to let you see the child. And then that brought a lot of memories back to him, which he should have had some therapy for. So he lost his job. Now, remember, I'm talking about trauma and stress, life stressors. He lost his job at the hospital and he decided today was the day. He did a video. He went to the girlfriend's house. Yes, I remember that. Yes. Yeah. He yes. worked right here at Fred's hospital. Okay? Oh, wow. And he went to the girlfriend and basically said, you know, I'm not going to see my child. You're threatening me, et cetera. Bang, bang. But then he went to the ex, the wife's house down the street and said, and this is how it started, as she's opening the door, oh, so she sees him, and she's trying to close the door. He said, today is the day. I remember that, yes. Yep. And he yes. shot himself. So was he crazy? For that moment, he was. And he wasn't going to yeah. jail. And he videoed, he told, he walked through. So think about his mind at the time. Now, now Doc, I need to ask you, and then I want Lisa to chime in, but I'm going to ask you, Doc, but then I'll, I'll yield back to you. And then I want Lisa to chime in because Lisa and I, we had this big discussion last week. Mm -hmm. And I was saying that to me, is that, and, and maybe, like I said, please educate me, enlighten me, because to me, from a law enforcement standpoint, that's premeditated. And, and I get it. Can he snap? But is there a point where you can snap and still be conscious in, 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 in your mind to say what I'm going to do? Because like, I don't want to see this man going around shooting all these homeless people. And then all of a sudden he gets arrested and I said, oh, I'm, I'm mentally disturbed. Now, 
the man uh that jumped over the counter at the museum that I sent you. I would have played the footage. Maybe I'll play it tomorrow or Wednesday. The man that jumps over the counter because he couldn't get his his card renewed. Is this is this mental illness or is this just being spoiled? Because this new generation, Norman, you said something like this, and like I said, please enlighten me because I'm under the pressure. Like with impression, like Norm said, yo, some of these kids might just need a little ass whipping. Because Doc, we're family. You know what I'm saying? We know how our family raised us. You understand what I'm trying to say? Norm, we all hear Lisa, I'm assuming you're in our age group. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That there was a certain structure in how we were raised. You know and, I am. <laughs> I know, but I'm just trying to be nice, sister. Don't be mean. <laughs> but I'm trying to say that there is a certain mentality now that kids talk back, talking back to us, you might have got your fronts knocked out. Now kids talk back. So is it being spoiled and not getting what you what you want? I'm not talking about the, the uh, I know about the gentleman, but I still need you to talk about the psyche, Doc. Because when he went and planned to go kill his wife, he had to sit and think this out. Help me understand that. And then I'll, 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 I'll yield back to you, Doc. And then Lisa, you can chime in and know him. You can follow in. Go ahead. Me? Yes, Doc. He was hopeless. You know, it's interesting. So at that time, it was the adrenaline. I, I, and I know the law enforcement don't, the enforcement don't like, but he was temporarily insane. All right. Yeah. And to the point where he just had a, excuse my friend, effort everything. You know, I just can't take it anymore. And this is the person who perpetrated. This is the person who perpetrated. Because even when you hear about folks who finally, shoot their husband or their boyfriend or whoever been sexually abusing them over the years and that person made me sleep but right. it was like enough is enough is enough and they shoot him mm -hmm. so premeditated to the point but it was like he was replaying all what was going through his head replay and everybody was choking him the ex-wife was choking him you're not gonna see your kids but this girl was choking him and he lost his job so it was like all of a sudden the volcano erupted. Gotcha. Even though he quote unquote planned it, but it was like, I can't take it anymore. And the part of the eruption of the volcano was taking everybody okay. out. So mm, I understand. And you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share a story later on, um, but I, I want everybody to have a time. So Lisa, what's your take on this? Because last week you and I were having this conversation and it seemed like the doc kind of unknowingly kind of sided with what you're saying. So elaborate, Lisa, as much as you want to, please. Well, I just want to go back to what you stated initially about the um, gentleman, I'm going to call the gentleman, who threw the feces into the woman's face. You know, mm -hmm. I know we've spoken about that, or at least you brought it up this evening, but we spoke about the, uh, the museum gentleman who jumped the counter as well but to you is I don't think it mental illness then you said that it's premeditated but what would prompt someone to think on that level what is your I, belief what, what's my belief and what prompts somebody to think on that level um in regards to i right. i don't know I don't know that answer, but I, yeah. when I'm talking, when I'm talking about a person now that's that's going around killing people, homeless people, and then he'll later on he'll claim mental illness. He's a serial killer right now. I'm going, like I said, I'm coming from a law enforcement yeah. standpoint. I'm now we talk about the man that was at the museum, mm -hmm. and because he couldn't get to see a video, and his card had his his, his uh, uh, membership got re re uh, expired or suspended. He got mad because they wasn't going to let him in and he jumps over the counter and he just starts stabbing people. You're going to tell me just because of that, he, he, he I'm going to give him the, the, the credit to say he's mentally ill. Well, you, you came there with a knife. So, and then you knew, you might've known your, 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 your car was suspended. And then you asked them and they told you and they're doing their job. And then all of a sudden they say, uh, no, you can't go in. So you get in such a rage and then now you just want to jump over the counter and start stabbing people. You still didn't get to see the movie or whatever the, the show that you wanted to see. So now I'm supposed to say that you're mentally ill. 
like I said, and I don't want to sound so heartless and, 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 and disconnected, but the thing is, when I think it's like the guy that breaks up, gets caught cheating on his girl, and the girl steps away and says, I don't want to be with you no more. And he's like, no, you're not going to leave me. And then all of a sudden, she starts dating somebody else, and now he goes and he kills, shoots the guy. Am I supposed to say everything is mentally ill? And that's why I'm glad the doctor's here, you're here, Norman's here. When do we say you're accountable for your actions? And I'm not, please, I don't want anybody out there listening no. in the RTC man and think that I am unsensitive to mental illness. Not at all. Because I will tell you a story before we leave tonight about a situation where I almost popped, right? There might have been a, a few of them, but I can tell you about a situation I, I almost popped after my mother passed away. And they didn't, the bank, Citibank didn't want to give me her money. And I told Citibank after they had me there for almost five hours, giving me the runaround, not wanting to give me my mother's money. I told them, I told the manager that the, the head manager wasn't there. And he had told me at the time, if anything you need, call me. The, the assistant manager was like, oh, I put, they put me on the phone with corporate. Corporate told me damn near to violate and break a law and sign open up another account in her name. She was deceased. That would have been fraud, right? So I told the manager, the general manager, the assistant manager that was there, and I told the lovely lady and two people that I met there, I said, listen, don't come in tomorrow. I said, what do you mean don't come in tomorrow? Because I said, tomorrow, if I, if this bank doesn't give me my money, we're going to make the news. And that's God's honest truth. So was that mentally ill? I just, did I snap? I sure did, because I got fed up, right? But it was premeditated because I went home knowing that I was going to do something that, thank God, it didn't get done. And when I tell you, they called me at 730 in the morning and said, Mr. Forster, come get your money. I said, do you want me to bring this and bring that? They said, no, we just want you to get your money and get the hell out of our face. <laughs> because I had already given, given them the death certificate. I had given them all yeah. the other statements. I had given them the fact that I was the only heir. Right. And they started to play with me emotionally after my mother just passed. I wasn't having it. So did I snap or did I know knowingly, but I just got fed up. So we got to find out that that fine line. Now, when I was going to jail for that, yeah. And the lady said, yo, your, your parents raised you right. I said, lady, you don't even know me. I said, but I just bet you one thing, you better have my money tomorrow when I come down here. And I and I went through all the steps that you told you. To, and I still get annoyed with that today because don't play. Certain people you don't play with. So... We're talking about thousands of dollars in care of a lieu of, and this, is, this ha it has nothing to do with being spoiled, Lisa. This had to do with principle. Some people are willing to die and, and, and live for what they believe in. Seeing a videotape at a museum, you can't tell me that. You got Netflix, you got YouTube, you got so many other things. You go to a museum of art. Now, you can't even go to a museum without getting stabbed now? Go ahead, Lisa. Well, no, no, no. Okay. So, like, yes, they have great quality, okay? And mental illness runs along the spectrum. So, well, you know, we can't look at mental illness as everybody has the same of mental illness because some people don't have it at that level. You know, depression meets the parameters for a mental health problem or mental illness. But someone with depression is not going to do the same thing someone who has schizophrenia would do. Right. Um, yeah. I just want to share a personal story for a moment. Um, my niece, she was murdered in um, Washington, D.C. by wow. another female. Um, and it was a love triangle thing. Uh, the other female uh, had children with this guy, but um, what she did was um, she caught my in a bodega and she stabbed her 19 times. Mm. And no one would stop it. And it was at 5.30 in the afternoon. You wow. Know? wow. Nobody would stop it. They said she was a big girl. They were afraid to stop her. Um, the young lady got sentenced to 20 years. Um, that left five kids without mothers, right? The young lady had four kids. My niece had one child. But the judge in this particular case, 
he hit this young woman with highest um that he applied because she had uh prior interact interactions with the criminal justice system um but she had a host of mental health problems that weren't addressed mm -hmm. he was on probation she was under supervision but she was allowed to skip those appointments that she had um to meet with counselors and social workers and like she didn't show up and her mental illness got more of control she began to spiral mm -hmm. she was charged with arson the year prior because her boyfriend you know at the time she thought he had a girl in his house he took her 18 month old child on her hip and went to a gas station filled up a can of gasoline and went and poured it in front of his door mm. and forced him to come out with who she thought well who she thought was another female in the house, but he didn't have a female in the house and she wow. got 30 days of jail time and was placed on probation like so, so let me and then she question, didn't even you. comply with but let me ask you a question. Do you think that person needed, because I know I we talked about, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Lisa? Yes, I can. can do you think? Yes, I that can. Person, do you think that person that you're discussing need 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 to be re re rehabilitated? No. Cause, Bill, cause, I yes. went to, I had to, you know, I presented a victim impact statement. And my in my statement, I said that to me, the system failed all of them. System okay. failed the kids, the system failed the murderer, the mm -hmm. system failed my niece. I mm -hmm. went to all specifics of these women and some of the challenges that they had in their lives, but it mm -hmm. was a system, it was a system failure. Okay. Wow. Um, and for me, there's definitely an intersect between system failures and institutional racism, you know. Okay. Um, wow. Just like most urban areas, you know, services, um, social services, medical services, mental health services are not the way they need to be. They're not tangible to a lot of people. You know, when I've done case management, a lot of the um, clients, they don't, they have no idea where to go for mental health services or they go, but they stick with it because there's that lack of cultural competency, you know, the now, uh, Lisa, for a or the Hold therapist, on. they're Hold not on, well connected. Hold on, Lisa. Hey, Doc, are you there? Okay. I know, I know you have, I know we only have you for a certain amount of time. Lisa and Norman, we'll, con we'll continue this but I want to yield back to the doctor since she is the co-host. Doctor, mm -hmm. from what you're hearing in a lot of things, uh, what's your what's your take on a lot of things? Well, you know, what one thing we better address, and, and I'm sorry to hear about your niece, uh, Lisa, but we better address the you know mm -hmm. the young people because they grow up and, and, and they do crime even before they grow up. And unfortunately, we're not dealing the schools. Um the corrections, the pre-corrections. You know, one of the things that I do, mm -hmm. I, I, I am a ringside fight doc. So I, we have at least 600 youth in the different rec centers and they box. They start boxing at five years old, six years old to be have some positive interaction and to begin to have them have outlets. Because years ago we had the rec centers, the real, you know, like, and, and they had all the, the village help take care and raise. You can't spank a child now, you'll go to jail. Mm -hmm. You can't grab a child. Today, I had a 12-year-old a, a in my chair right here in the office where I'm still in my lair. So we put him in a chair to draw blood. Well, he acted like a, a raging bull. The mother said, see, Doc, this is what I'm talking about. You know, he doesn't respect grownups. He doesn't, I said, well, he's going to respect this one. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I said, that's, now, the, fourth, I worked, that's I worked, the fourth way right there, baby. I worked in corrections. <laughs> So I looked right. at him. I said, now we could do this nicely. Get a look. Oh, we don't have to do it nicely, but we're going to get it done. 
Right. Okay. Right. Now I'm by then gritting my teeth. Out. <laughs> so the mother, the mother's looking at me and she's like, go, doctor. And I said, now get your in this chair. You know, mm -hmm. my staff, mm -hmm. you know, hold your own, look away if you got to. I get it. But you're gonna right. get this done. Absolutely. So at the end of the visit, okay, by the way, he got it done because I'm looking right at him. He know my eyes were crazier than some of the police officers' eyes. You're gonna get this done. Okay? Okay. All right, we ain't playing with you. you ain't kicking me because the feet got to go on. He 150 pounds. I'm like, oh no, I can take you down. Now I, right, I right. said I worked in corrections, but I'm not trying to do that. I want to be on the news today. So we got the blood work. After that, he, my cousin, two that's booster, that's he had to get two booster shots. He got that. Mm -hmm. And I just said, just work with me, baby. Work with me. I've been seeing him since he was an infant. At the end of the visit, he walked past, you know, we've all done. He said, first, thank you, Dr. Porter, and I apologize. I apologize for my actions. So, you know, you have to let them know you care about them, but you have to also make sure that they know there are guidelines and there, there are things you can and cannot do. And that's where we have a problem. We don't tell them and we don't teach them. So there we have them running them up. So they can be so angry and anger management is, you know, they can be out of control. And that's one thing. That's not mental illness. That's just called poor raising. We didn't raise them. And that's okay. my point. That's my point. Doc, I'm I'm gonna send it to you. I don't know if I sent it to you, but I don't know if Lisa and, and Norm have seen this. But I'm like I said, everybody, I'm gonna yield back to the doctor because we only got it for about eight minutes yeah. or nine minutes. But the thing is, did you see the, the, I showed it to Malika the other yesterday, I think it was. A grandmother was talking to her, I guess her grandson or something, and she asked him to do something and he didn't like it. I'm gonna find it and I'm gonna send it to you. Please and he kicked her. He kicked his grandmother down. His grandmother tried to get up. Then he jumped on her. So they're wrestling. But then somebody is videotaping this. Let me tell you something. In the life, oh my God. If, could you imagine? He would have been thrown across the room. I would have found the strength. Okay. <laughs> I, I promise you, I will send it to you at 840 when we get off this call. Okay. When, after I finish with Norman and Lisa, mm -hmm. right. it, I was so, Malika was like, I can't even watch it. Everybody who has seen it is, is is appalled by what they've seen. And this is my point when I mentioned to Lisa and Norm, and remind me, you two, to, when we pick it up, but I want to stay on the dock for her minute, her time, that is that spoiled or that's bad? Like the child that you just referred to, is he spoiled? Is he just bad? Because that sounded like uh, uh, your Uncle Bill whipping my ass. Right. You understand what I'm talking about? Right. It sounds like my Aunt Doris whipping your ass. That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's so, right. So help me understand this. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because there are times when the person can be so angry as we ended up talking later in the visit. And, uh, you know, I hate to blame the father, but the father's not really in his life and he's in and out of his life. And the father's girlfriend just had got pregnant and the baby died. And all this, all this thing is on the, this child mind as well. And he told his teacher. Now, here's what he did. He went to his teacher and said, I'm sad. He started telling his teacher stuff. He said, and I want to cut myself. So I I told him, I'm glad that you are talking because some children just don't. And they do more than just cutting themselves. But meantime, the anger, we have to address it. We still have to address it. It is not okay to bite, to kick, etc. It is not okay. So, so sometimes when you're out of control because you haven't been raised properly and then finally you just don't get your way then you're going to have a situation be it behavior issues acting inappropriately stomp scream whatever or hurt and injured then you're going to see the people the legal folks so so there is a, st a, st a statement that we say in medicine that is a thin line you know between me mental health between sanity and insanity and we don't really know when that thin line, when that line is crossed, but we want to make sure that every most of our folks stay on the other side of that line. Now, be it a serial killer, be it someone who just is homeless, you know, they're, they're, it's, a, it's, it's individualized and we need to address it. And I say that we as a whole village, but we definitely in the medical field, we got to stop pushing it aside or he looks all right, except we have to ask. We must ask and ask and start asking at a young age and ask those parents, how's it going? Because they have an issues too. So 
you know, it's just we we have to get into it because otherwise we write our little whatever we're writing. The physical is done. He's able to play sports, whatever, whatever we're doing. And we missed the opportunity. Wow. Everybody, this is Real Talk Chronicles. I'm your host, Bill Forster, with my co-host, Dr. Marilyn Corder. This is Real Talk with the doctor and our special guest today, Norman Davis, and, and my special guest, Lisa Whiteside. We're having Real Talk and we're talking about mental illness. And I appreciate all the comments and questions. Doc, I want to ask you this a question. Um, you said there's a thin line, and then I'll yield to Norman and Lisa, let them, if they have a question to ask you before you get out of here. Um, and then I just want to read some comments. You said there's a thin line. How do we find that line from a psychological? I mean, do you, what kind of evaluations are being done to find out the when that that snap point? Like, is it a la light switch? What, like, what? What? what I, I I don't know. You know. So you know, it's very it varies. Now, you can have someone who's trying to act appropriate and they just can't, and 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 as they are being evaluated and they all need to be evaluated and you know sometimes the evaluation can be off can be wrong but when someone is having a short fuse when someone um is acting inappropriate be, you know there there's some i call it behavior modification i am not into medications like like that like you know because they're making you zombies but i am into behavior management and behavior therapy and life coaching so they can talk it out you know sometimes when you have had a super duper bad day or something happened, you feel better when you talk to somebody. You, you know, when you when you talk to somebody, it's almost like they didn't stop, they didn't take it away, but at least you shared it. So that heavy lifting is not just on you. But when you talk to, as I talk to my colleagues, my psychiatrists and psych psych like psychologists, you know, if you have a good psychologist. Right? Often you don't need a psychiatrist that's just going to write you medication. No offense to the psychiatrists out there, but they the sensitivity has to be there, and you and they have to feel that you want to help them. And even though, and and I agree when when they go into corrections, let's say a young person who's having issues for whatever reason, bipolar, anger anger management issues, oppositional defiant issues all of the above issues and a little ADHD where they're impulsive and they find themselves locked up. Sometimes that's the first time they will get some therapy and someone to hear them, sadly enough, once they have a record. Wow. Everybody, this is Real Talk Chronicles. That's Dr. Marilyn Corder. Before mm -hmm. she gets out of here, and Doc, you know you're always, I know you will listen, but I know not to go over my doc, my cousin's hour. So Norman and, and Lisa, we will continue the conversation. Doc, she may be listening. She may write in and stuff like that. But hold on, Doc, before you leave, I just want to use some comments in, in case Norman and Lisa have a question for you before they get out of it. Stefania said, yes, Doc, there's no more of that village mentality and no more no boundaries. Stefania also says, no, that was, the, that was his grandma. That was not his grandma. The elderly woman's son brought those kids to her house as like a, a babysitting thing. Then her daughter was the one recording. Just evil. I couldn't even watch it. It was definitely... Colin said the person who videotaped it instead of knocking his ass out <laughs> should be held accountable. Shout right. out to Collins in the building. Safania so said the new style of raising kids is clearly not working. Something has to change. Norman and Lisa, we will continue that conversation. Also, um, Colin said hold the parents accountable for the minor, uh, the minor child behavior in public. Absolutely. Angel Ray said oh. Dr. Court is teaching. And uh, Stefania, that's directed to Collins. And, and Tanisha Lear, she said, amen, she's absolutely right, and express and holding yourselves accountable. Before the doctor gets out of here, Norman and Lisa, do you have a question for the doctor? Because the doctor will always leave with positive. And, I, and before you get to questions, but we got to stop buying these kids $300 tennis shoes. Absolutely. We got we got to stop buying these kids all of these Gucci's and whatever because they want it. Can you imagine? Economics are tight right now. They have often, often have been. But how are you going to buy them? these names that you know the gucci the this i'm so sick of seeing it you know and and they're not respecting you they're walking around with their pants up pants hanging down i have to tell them you come back here you, you can't you can't show your buns you can't show your butt yeah if you show it i'll give it put you and put a needle in it okay so you got to be showing your butt hey think about this hey, <laughs> how, how, how do these kids at 12 13 years old or maybe even younger have the same kind of phone that we have 
that that's absurd. It Absolutely. doesn't make a sense. Absolutely. And, and don't have a job. Well, and, and they ride around with I, iPhone 13s and 17s and and or Galaxy yeah. 22s and 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 or, or they're wearing this Jordans. You don't five, even know who Jordan five, is. Five, five look, and they and it matches every day. Okay. Yeah. Like, what? You know, and the parents feel obligated, they're pressured. Oh, and then some of the behavior. I said, you better go to Payless and get a dude next week. Absolutely. And put that online. And <laughs> How about okay. that? That's what's up. Uh, Lisa, Norm, do you have a question for the doctor before she gets out of here? You guys are staying with me. So uh, do you have anyone, you have a question or statement for the doctor? Lisa? My only question okay, is go, this. Go ahead, Norm. Go ahead, Norm. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Doctor, yeah. Doctor well, Collier, I just you? wanted to know. One at a time. Go ahead. No, go, ahead Lisa. go, Lisa. Go first. But doc. Somebody okay. better go. Lisa, Lisa, Please, go first. Doc. Thank you. It was a mm -hmm. pleasure speaking. You can hear me. I can yes. hear you. Yes. Hello? Yes. Mm -hmm. We can hear you. Hello. Okay. Hear, yeah, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. I've learned a lot from you, and I, I I appreciate your presence. I appreciate being here. Um, before I, my question to you is: there clearly there are children with um, child mental disorders. Um, my concern is that oftentimes that behavior, when left untreated, lends itself to criminal lized punishment right and they enter into the juvenile detention facilities then they enter in correctional facilities you know like at what point are those behaviors treated or do you think they, they should be treated so and or was, it leads into someone in moscow i don't know so, you know, too bad we're not like we were years ago. When someone's child is disorderly or bad, from the teacher to the people who own the store to the Miss So-and-so, Miss Jones down the street, you would have got spanked and jacked up, up until down to your parents. We don't have that system anymore. It's, I call it the reinforcement village. I saw front and mm -hmm. center children who did not need to be you know, in, in jail, go to jail for just a threat here or there or what have you. Mm -hmm. And it's, they call, I call them the throwaway victims. And and we just have to do a better job. We have failed them. When they, when they come into corrections, we have failed them. And I know as a medical director, I did things that the, the director of the prison said I was doing too much for these children. They would come in. I let them use a phone, phone anytime. Just tell them, see me. And they come in and I'm like, we're gonna call your grandmother, we're gonna call your, your daddy, whoever he is, we're gonna call everybody, and I'm gonna talk to them with you. Why the hell are you up in here? Okay, why? And then when we have the intake, the meetings, etc., to talk about, you know, who where does this child get detained? Does he get committed? Can he go home? Etc. I'm in the meetings. The, the director, why are you in the meetings? Because I care. Lots of them, I know their grandparents, being from southeast Washington. Lots of them, several of them were my patients even in my uptown office. And I used to tell them, you're going to be, you're going to get in trouble soon. Oh, why are you saying that? Not me, not me. And of course, they, they're there. So they're looking at me like, Dr. Gordy, what you doing here? I'm like, what the question is, what you doing here? Right. Okay. I get to go home every day. So, yeah. so we have to be in positions where we can make a change. So those youngsters that I got out and got them into different programs and pretty much threatened the parents, the grandparents, et cetera, you got to do right by them. You know, one thing I, I have to say, Judge Mathis, Greg Mathis, who I've met several times because we've done panel discussions on juvenile corrections. He was from Detroit, inner city. He went to jail. He's a juvie. Yep. The district in Detroit spent $30,000 for him being in jail for, thir for six months. When he got out, he was the brotherhood. I believe it was the um, Men to men, you know, one of one of the organizations that help mentor and help keep young men straight. He was he benefited, and fortunately, he was able to be a part of that. So he finished high school, he finished college, University of Detroit, and then he went to law school. Now, the education from the undergrad all the way through law school 
did not cost thirty thousand dollars, but it cost thirty thousand dollars to lock them mm -hmm. up for six months. And I say this is what we call modern day slavery, modern day plantation. So mm -hmm. we have to also look at the politicians who are allowing that, as opposed to wraparound services. And you know, I don't want Bay Bay, the child that's carjacked you and murdered you, et cetera, to come out. He or she, he needs to stay in a little longer, get some rehabilitation. But these little minor things, all they're doing is making these young people harder and harder. Absolutely. So, so yeah. Judge Mathis finally, when he finished law school, he went up for his boards, his bar, and they rejected him twice because they said, Oh, you've been in jail. He finally convinced them. I mean, he aced all of law school. He's ADHD impulsive. While he's studying in law school in the lecture hall, he's reading a car magazine. He's eating chips and looking at the professor all at the same time. And these ADHD children are very bright, very creative. We just got to give them a chance. Mm. So he finally was accepted to for the bar. And what does he do now? He puts and he now he is the highest. I mean, you're talking a judge as well as a TV personality. And he has programs for ADHD children in Detroit. So he's making a difference. And that's what we have to do. When you get a certain level, even before you get a certain level, just be a parent and be a real parent. Snatch that child up, pinch them, do whatever so mm -hmm. the city won't see you. But just when they go wrong, you have to make sure they go right. Absolutely. Facts. So Norm, do you, final words. Norm, do you have a question for the doctor before she goes? Yes. Good, good evening. Do you see any relief in sight? In general, <laughs> um, relief. Yeah. So, relief in sight for uh, mental health. For uh, I have a, I have my own opinion about the correction system because when they change the laws now, the people that's locked up are not getting re rehabilitated the way they should. Right. They're not getting. They're not putting services in the prisons the way they should. So, do you see any relief in sight? I mean, it it, it needs to be worldwide, not just right. citywide or statewide. So, you know, the relief I see, and you know, as I said here, I'm not a politician, but we need to. I think Barack helped out some, but as we are here, ten years later. We need to make sure that we start from day one, one child at a time. We can't rely on the systems. When I say the systems, I mean, I, you know, we have the schools, you know, now, well, I'll say this, this past fall, the ad admissions to historical black colleges were the highest they've ever been, ever. And I say, because what we have to do years ago when my mother and daddy, which we were being educated, we had our own schools. Yeah. Yes. And, and we 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 mm. knew what we had to do. My children went to a private school here in DC called Roots. And you can imagine. Okay. It, so and mama and baba. So and so 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 we have to make sure that they have self-pride, that they have confidence, that they know who they are. Mm. And then we have to make sure that we stand up to that, to to them and have them stand up to their worthiness and their maximal potential and that takes a lot and even if it means homeschooling that takes a lot so that the gangs won't be so attractive versus the positiveness is where they the ray where they need to go that light they need to follow otherwise they're lost so one child at a time prior to when you're pregnant you know i call i tell people pre-pregnancy be prepared to parent Okay, because once that child is there, you know, you have to make sure that you're providing wisdom, you're providing um, knowledge, confidence, and, 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 and maximize that brain. So that's how I see it. And this is how I talk. I, you know, I do a couple shows. I do being Black News Channel. I do, th I do things that as much as I can reach them beyond my radio show, I'm trying to empower. It doesn't have to be a college grad mother or father. Just know and love your child and know the right from wrong. Amen. Doc, tell them where they can listen to you and give us some positive affirmation before we get out of here. Love okay, you. So every Saturday, I'm I have my own show. It's called Radio One. It's 95.9 .9 FM. So it's Radio One W O L. 
1450 AM, 95.9 FM. Now, let me also tell you, my, my engineer told me I'm supposed to say WOLDC News, WOLDC News.com. And it will say Dr. Quarter Show, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. every Saturday. Yeah. I do also WHUR for those, and that's Howard. I'm the medical correspondent, well, the adolescent correspondent. And I do Black News Channel. I was on there a few times through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's coming out of Atlanta, BNC. Uh, check, that, check that station out. Um, I do WURD, Word, which comes out in... Philadelphia, as a matter of fact, cause all right now, all right, right all right, <laughs> with Charles, <laughs> with Charles Ellison. That's but it. you know, I um, all I can say is, you know, sure, I'm a pediatrician, my own practice, and all that. But I, I, I need to reach the rest of the world, and I, I will say this: here's my CBD. I also, and Stefania, I need your address because I owe you some CBD. But I'm telling folks, uh, instead of all that other medication and toxic stuff, yeah, take some CBD gummies. It's CBD drops. It helps your mood, helps you sleep. It makes you more positive. And you ain't getting high. And you're not getting becoming a zombie uh, like some of the medications we write. So that's it. I asked, and Lord, I'm going to drop the mic, but I will say knowledge is power and we need to empower everyone. And you're also a real talk chronicles. That's another thing. That's, the, uh, that's number one. You guys are looking. <laughs> so I want real talk chronicles. Thank you, cousin. All Love right. You. I told you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Norman and Norman. Norman. All right. Everybody, Bye -bye. that's Dr. Marilyn Corder. That's Real Talk Chronicles. Bye. We're gonna we're, we're gonna finish it out with you guys because you know we she's so busy and I'm so thankful that she shares her time with us. But you know, I, I try to hold her to her hour. But the thing is, what do you guys think? What's the solution? What's the answer? How do we solve this? Because yeah. go ahead, brother. Let me let me say this. In this pandemic that started in 2019, we have been getting to know people in our house. It's you know, we see them a couple of days out the week, maybe on the weekend. Now we're in there 24-7. That puts a lot of stress on you mm -hmm. because you're getting to re, re reintroduce yourself to that person. And some things you don't like about them that you really find out, oh, I don't like that. Yeah. And you have to have, be open to talk to them and tell them why mm -hmm. you don't like certain things. You know, when my, when my stress and my level got to the point, you know, my wife, she has MS. My wife has MS. Mm -hmm. I lost the leg. My mother-in-law is stroke. Uh, just so much going on, you know. Before everything happened, my leg, I was going to build a house. You know, I bought some land and I was going to build another house, and just you know, things happen. And when your mind snap, this is from a this is from a, a law 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 enforcement perspective and a personal perspective. Yes, it's premeditated, but no. You don't think about it, if, if that makes sense. I get, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. I mean, let me just say this, and I'm going to bring Lisa in. Lisa, please chime in um, when you get a chance. Like I said, when I talk about that, that, that time when the bank was giving me the runaround after I got all the paperwork that they asked for, the death certificate and stuff like that, I didn't, I didn't care. I mean, not having any biolo biological children not being in a relationship at that time, just losing the person that I took care of for five years, terminally ill. You know, my mother and I, we did it with my father and I, me being an only child. And then the fact that I, I'm sitting here and anybody that knows me, I, like I always say, I have the cunningness of Michael and the temperament of Sonny from The Godfather, right? Like, don't push the button, leave me alone. But I, I'm going I'm, I'm going to try to keep the fire dust, you know, out. I don't, don't, I don't want to strike your flame, so don't strike mine. But when you sat here and, and they sat here and ran me around, and I'm sitting in a bank for almost five hours after I got all the paperwork that you asked for, and then I come back and you tell me, oh, well, we don't need the paperwork. And then now I tell you, well, okay, well, I'm waiting for you to cash the check. 
and then you tell me what well, we're not going to give it to you. What do you mean? And when you talk about premeditated, yeah, it was premeditated because you know what? It was about pride. And, and this is what I have to understand about when we talk about mental illness or snapping, as we've all eloquently stated in certain situations, it was like, it was personal to me. I don't know if that was uh, 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 mentally, it was, I mean, mentally I, I thought it out. It was, but it was like, yo, my parents had always taught me, don't let anybody take advantage of you. Don't let anybody. So it's instilled in, instilled in me that I'm not gonna let anybody take advantage of me. You're not gonna take a pen, a pencil from me without some kind of repercussions. It's just who I am. My mother built that in my father. They was like, yo, you know, we what were we? We brought up, we'd be like, yo, don't start a fight. But if somebody mess with you, you pick up something, uh, pick up something and go upside their head, right? So I say all that to say when I went home, me knowingly saying to myself, they're gonna give me my money, or I'm gonna make the move. Because right now, all the people that have loved me, I wasn't going to shame them because they weren't here anymore. And I, when I told them, and I meant it, I swear, I told them before I left that bank, I was like, you, I'm just using you as an example, Lisa. I was like, Lisa, don't come to work tomorrow. Norm, don't come to work tomorrow. And they was like, why? I said, because, yo, if they don't have my money, we're going to make the news. Right? And they was like, the lady, I couldn't believe, and it's so funny, the lady said, oh, Mr. Forster, you're, you're, you're a detective and your, your, your mother wouldn't want you to be that way. I said, you don't know my mother, so shut the F up, right? I said, if you really thought about my mother, you give me that money. But otherwise than that, I said, my mother would not allow, if she was alive, she would not allow me to be taken advantage of. And I went home, I slept on it. I tell you, it was like taxi driving dog day afternoon. I went out and laid out some <laughs> fatigues. I had my Tim's on. I had my black hat. I had several guns. And I was going there in the morning. So now it rained. So that just made it worse. So now I'm wearing fatigues and an army jacket. And I'm getting up in the morning. Let me tell you, I didn't even know a long clock. That phone rang, I swear, at 7.30. And they said, yo, Mr. Forster, the lady had, she was a Caribbean descent. She had an accent, like, like I think Guyanese. And she was like, Mr. Forster, I was like, yeah. She's like, hi, this is, you know, so-and-so, you know, the assistant manager at the bank. I said, yeah, I know who it is. She said, listen, we have your check. Can you come and get it? I said, do you want the, you know, the death certificate or you want the uh, power of attorney and all that? She said, Mr. Forster, we just want you to come get your money and, leave, and, and, and don't come back, right? I said, you sure now? Because I said, if I come down there and there's some shit, she said, Mr. Forster, please just come get your check. We trust me. When I walked in that bank, you thought they was looking at uh, 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 the finest woman in the world. Everybody turned and started looking at me or the craziest man in the world. So I say all that to say, going back to the stories that we're talking about, premeditated, absolutely. Did I snap? No, I knew what I was doing. What I've gone, what, what, what if, if they, I, and I'm, I'm being honest, full transparency, real talk. If they wouldn't have gave my money. Would there have been real talk right here? I don't think so. It would have been from a jail cell. You know what I'm saying? Because that we all have buttons. We all have buttons. We all have things that push us to a ledge. Norman, the things that you were going through, I can't even imagine. We both we both share diabetes. So we talk about stuff like that. So I don't, God forbid, I hope I never get to that situation because I would I would need you to talk me off that ledge. You understand what I'm trying to say? But yeah, is that is that commit committing violence to another person? So when we start talking mental illness, we start talking health issues, we start talking situations, because the bottom line is we, I think Lisa, Norm, myself, I'm sure there's somebody that we love enough that we would hurt somebody for messing with them. Yeah. That's not mental illness. That's just who we are as people. If you're, if you're if, I, don't, I don't know any, like when I teach women domestic violence or women in self-defense and stuff like that, I, or men, I always teach women. I say, listen, I said, listen, I want you to fight like somebody tried to rape you or take your or hurt your child. And I teach men, I say, listen, I want you to defend yourself like um, somebody just punked you. Because the worst thing that could ever happen to a man is to be punked in front of a woman. He cannot, he can never live, live with that. 
That is probably the most tormenting thing that can happen to a man. And for a woman, I'm sure that's probably the one of the most things that you, for you to deal with is somebody to violate your personal space or, or, or hurt your child. Lisa, what's your take on what I'm saying? You've said so much. Um, and I have so many takes. Um, well, go ahead, please. Join in, in, in the floor. Go ahead, sis. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how I want to structure what it is mm -hmm. I want to say. But right. um, I, I think it's important not to go to help. Um, and to look at it as premeditated or not premeditated. Um, mental illness runs deep in the community. Rather your mother beat you, rather she didn't. Um, I'm a mother. I'm a single parent. Um, I've been through hell and back. I know men my age or who I've dated along my years, who definitely had some mental health issues. Women have a rate of mental health problems. So like, and, and just listening to what we're talking about tonight, is it a fair statement to say that, um, you know, the person should have gotten an ass whooping when they were younger because a lot of people get an ass whooping when they were younger and they have difficulty coping as a result of that those ass whippings you know um i don't know i don't know i i, I well, well, well let me ask you a question lisa and i'll open it up to norman i mean yeah. we, live in a, we live in a we live in a cruel world and 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 our parents, whether people want to realize it or not, have trained us not for a military war, but for life war. They trained us to not be taken advantage of. They trained, they trained us to get a job. They trained us to go to school to be a better person. They trained us from right from wrong. Anything in our life, we've been structured and trained to not be the, 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 the prey. Not to say that some, some of us have to be predators all the time, but... We are predators. Go after the get, get a good job, get a good education, get it. We're trained that way. So, you know, when it, when we do when we talk about this with mental illness, we have to understand we live in a, a, a society, and and when we're talking about mental illness, there's no way I, I will use the word weak when we talk about this because this is the whole topic of discussion. We all I'm sure have had some kind of suicidal thoughts at one time in the point. Oh, I hate this world. I, I don't want to do this. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I just kill myself. Nobody loves me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure I look in the mirror. I don't like what I see. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. I, I, how do how do we get past that, the confidence? There may be people that say, yo, you're a cocky son of a gun. I'm not cocky. I'm confident. But I've, I've, I've taught myself to stay that way. I'm going to be this way. You know, even if I look in the mirror, this time, at this day and age, I can look in the mirror and say, oh, Bill, you're looking a little heavy around the waist, or Bill, this or that. And I still say after Lisa, I love myself. I got to say I love myself. I tell Norm when we get off the phone, I love you, because I do. That's my do, you know, since 18, 19 years old, you know, playing ball together, you know, just hanging out. In, in college like i love him like i felt bad him telling me his story and i wasn't there because we get so consumed in our own personal lives that we're not there for each other and i'm talking about just just the mental stuff not so much maybe the incarceration and, and things of that magnitude so we're just talking about the healthy mental aspect of life you know i try to be there for anybody that i care for lisa if god forbid you had a bad day and you felt like you was walking a tightrope and you called me from us interacting now. I hope I could be an ear for you. You understand what I'm trying to say? And I hope vice versa. But, but the bottom line is a lot of us, are, we live in a selfish world. We only care about our own needs, our own wants. And, and is that 
mental illness because somebody spazzes out because they can't get what they want. You get people getting mad. And, and what was that movie, Break, uh, Break, Breaking Down with, with, with Michael Douglas and, and the, the person's name he played was Bill Forster. He spazzed out in, what was it, McDonald's? Because he was like, the burger doesn't look like it does on the, on the thing. And he shot up the, 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 the little restaurant. People are fighting in restaurants for things. Where's the discipline? We are not trained anymore. And I use that word figuratively, loosely, how, whomever, however you, anybody has to take it to be structured, to be better people, a law-abiding citizen, or just be law-abiding children to our parents. I mean, we understand good kids, bad kids. I don't know. I can ramble on. Norm, Lisa, what's your take on this stuff, please? Help me out. Well, for me, well, I did. Um, I did undercover for about three years. I was undercover, and you have to put on that persona of a whole. Different, you have to take on that personality of a whole nother person. Yeah, and I'm talking about you know undercover. So your mindset goes to that you are something totally different than what you are. Yeah. And then you got to come back from that. You know, then you got to deal with family matters. You know, you got to deal with health issues. You got to deal with being a Muslim on the on, on a white police force. You know, it's things that you deal with in, in your everyday life. I remember one of my cases I worked, this was when I first came on the force. The man had his own business, came home from lunch, had a migraine, came home from lunch, his wife was in bed in that bed with another man. So he killed both of them, set the house on fire, and sat on the stairs and, and waited for the, the fire people to get there, the, the fire department to get there. Hmm. Because of who he was, they found him incompetent to stand trial. But yet, if it was one of us of color, we would have got life. It's just the fact that the law, the, the justice system is not made for or made by people of color. So it's easier to throw them away. It's easier to put them in jail and, and, and get, get some free labor out of them. Mental health or not, mental health is real and it doesn't bother people until they Very. get home. That, that little boy that mm -hmm. jumped on that older Absolutely. lady, the person that videotaped it needed to be charged as well. That's he, what needed Colin be said charged with, he needed to be charged with assault on the elderly and she needed to be whoever videotaped it needed to be uh, charged with a, mm -hmm. uh, the delinquency of a minor. Because it didn't make any mm -hmm. sense. I wish I would walk by and see a kid. I don't care if it's my kid or not. I wish I would see a child jumping on an older person. I'll be honest, I, I would have caught a charge. Absolutely. Because you know you can't you can't beat kids in public. I don't I know would, how it is up there. I'd have beat that. I'd have beat that little rascal's ass. He would have got that. He would have got that. Be some damn <laughs> sense into him. Be some damn sense into him. But we got to get back to where society's not. I read. Uh, in the medical journal, that domestic violence since this pandemic has risen forty percent. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I, see, I, I don't. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a shame that men don't, especially black men, don't not ha don't know how to express their feelings. You know. Mm -hmm. And um, our generation is doing it too. They're not exempt. And that's another thing. It's the generation that was born from what the book said. It was like from the late 80s, early 90s that they're having the most problems with. And, and I can see that because these are kids growing up by themselves. They're growing up with, with their peers. They're looking at their peers who are, who are looking at them. When we were growing up, we looked at 
the teachers, the policemen in our in our neighborhood. Because we grew when I grew up, we had police officers that lived in the neighborhood that policed the neighborhood. Nice. So we looked at them like, okay, we looked at the barber, we looked at people that was doing the men that were doing something, even the women that were nurses and nurses aides and uh secretaries and things like that. Nowadays kids don't know what they want to do. They have no outlet. They took away Bill, when we were growing up they had PSAL. They took away that. I'm in North Carolina, so I you know I'm going by what no, no I it's, grew up it's in New York. It, yo, no, it's just a building now. Nobody gets to play in there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's and, just a building. But now. what are they, what are they using the building for? They have a waste of space <laughs> That could be doing things for teachers are not babysitters. Yeah, Lisa, you're an educator. What what do you, what do you think? What's go, I mean, um, I mean, like I, said, I was for all of this. What do I think? I um, I, I guess you know if it's with misfortune that my life was different than what you have described. Um, my childhood wasn't easy. Um, my parents did a lot. They came from bigger families from the South. So there were some things they did know. There were some things that they didn't know. Um, my mother struggles with emotion. Okay. And the sharing of emotion. My brother confronted her one day. And she said that when she was growing up, there were too many kids for her parents to be emotional, you know, so she can't identify with it. Um, as a child, my brother got beaten really bad because my father, old school, Southern man, you know, man up do this, do that, do what I tell you to do. If my brother didn't man up, he wasn't a man up kind of guy. He was a mom boy. So he was conflicted, you know? My mother's hugging him and holding him and doing certain things with him. But my father is like looking from the corner of his eye, like, mm -mm, this ain't gonna work. You're gonna man up, right? Um, my brother eating a lot, a lot. And, and today he's not stable. He's definitely not mentally stable. Um, I ended up in alternative school. I went from being um, accepted into Brooklyn Tech to ending up being a truant to being sent to um, 600 school. Um, I had my, and I never talk about this openly, but I will say it to that I had my bout with um, alcohol and substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Before I went into corrections, I, I was definitely deeply involved from my teen years. So corrections saved, corrected my life. But, um, so I didn't have a lot of these things that, you know, you're talking about. I'm totally opposite. Um, mm -hmm. I think today people are more open with some of the stuff that they're going through. When we were coming through, there are a lot more secrets. It's not things didn't happen, yeah. but there were definitely way more secrets. Today, there's Facebook, there's social media. So there's way that people can tell the story and get a response in a matter of minutes. You know, they don't have to wait or think about who am I going to tell the story to? Are they going to tell on me? Is my mother going to beat my ass? You know, that just wasn't there. So um, I don't know. By the grace of God, I made it to where I made it. I've made the accomplishments that I made. But this wasn't supposed to be my journey. Not at all. Not at all. And, you know, you talk about how, you know, I am least, because we're all temporaries here, you know, how our families raised us a certain way and we didn't have this and we had cops in the community. You know what? I still got my ass busted by men my age. 
that grew up with me, you know, who were raised in a household with two parents who honored the curfew. And they played by all of the rules, all of the games that, you know, we're sitting here talking about now. I could talk to my mother and she tells me about how many children were out of wedlock and all of this stuff. The same challenges that we're having in society today, a lot of people that are our parents, the same challenges. They just don't talk about it the way that the millennials talk about it now. We don't, we're not cut from that cloth. We just don't talk about it. So true, Lisa. So true. Well, you know, Go ahead, Noah. Please. We grew up on, we grew up in the era where what happens in this house stay in the house. You know? That's now, right. A lot That's of right. Kids, a lot of shit happened in my kids, house. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of kids nowadays, the millenniums, use these social platforms as a way of getting sympathy. Mm. And some of it is real. And some of it's just for attention. And it's, you know, uh, it's unfortunate. I grew up with a single mother. And I had two sisters, one older and one younger. When my older sister passed, I never felt pain like that before. And I didn't have any outlet to, to say, you know, this is what I'm going through. Because we would, that was my sister, was, was, that, was my, that was my rock. You know, she was a crackhead. She, she she became a crackhead, but that was still she was still my sister. You know what I mean? And so that hurt me more than anything. And I couldn't understand why she didn't tell me some of the things that she needed to tell me. And it was like, well, you know, we don't talk about certain things. And I'm yeah. like, okay. We need to do better. I never, my, my path wasn't to be in law enforcement. I went to HBCU. My, my path was not this. Mm -hmm. And we don't know our path until we start mm -hmm. walking it. You know? Mm -hmm. And it's just by the grace, of, the grace of our God that we are still here to, to see it. To see, it's not, it's not over with yet. You know, so we're, we're still here to see it. But it's the things we, you know, I always tell anybody, when you wake up in the morning, you're having a great day. It's the stupid ass people you got to deal with during the day to make it good or bad. Absolutely. So Absolutely. don't be one of them stupid ass people. Don't be mm -hmm. one of them stupid people. You know, because you don't know, you never know how a kind word can affect a person. Absolutely. That's why I always Big try time. to put out. Sort of affirmation always put positive always put positive vibes only and, and you know force of the moment everybody this is real talk chronicles i'm your host bill forster this is real talk with dr marilyn quarter she was here she gave us a good hour of knowledge and my special guest lisa whiteside and norman davis we are just talking about mental illness but now we've transitioned into just health and 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 and, and mental and how things can mentally affect you so I, I want to say all that and I'm gonna read some comments and you know shout out to everybody that's chiming shout out to the sponsors Melba Melba Wilson's uh, uh Leon Chocolate Harlem Underground uh Delhi Arts Magazine and Soft Illusion I'll try to be better and, and, and mention those and throw those out there uh please try to support those establishments uh I just want to read some of the comments Shout out to Brian, my man watch, watching. Uh, you feeling better? Yvonne, two eight and a half, Pam Pam. I agree, Lisa. I know a few people that were beat severely as kids and they have a lot of emotional issues. Let me, I'll, I'll say this. I don't think there isn't anybody that hasn't been beat that haven't, doesn't have a certain issues, but we all persevere to a certain degree. I'm, I'm from the school where my father- Not all of us. Well, well, okay, not all of us. Some of us, it depends. You know, it is who, who we are, who we are, and and certain things happen. My, when I got beat, my father made me take off my clothes. So if, if, it, if that yes. was a form of a, 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 a self on self slavery, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you, you know, but it, it was what it was. I, I can say this. I, I, I didn't hear a lot of great compliments coming from my mother. 
You know what I'm saying? This is full transparency. This is real talk. Real talk started because of my mother. And me either. Excuse, what'd you say? No, I said me either. And, and, and it's interesting that we're both sharing this because now if you and I were in a relationship and we didn't have the knowledge that we have now, how toxic would that exchange be? Where yeah, but okay, but, but okay, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna show you how. Let me, let me just say this, and this is the difference between some and a few and all or none, right? I saw a, a, a toxic marriage between my mother and father, right? Not to say they didn't love each other, but maybe they might have been together for for to and stayed together with each other just to raise a, ch a child. But they argued so much, it, it was just mm -hmm. so disheartening to me, where to this day, Malika will tell you, don't yell at me. Don't argue. I will, I've will. i walked away from more relationships in my past because somebody raised their voice, because I feel you don't know how to respect me if you raise your voice. I'm not saying there is not times when voices may escalate, but if you raise your voice, then I feel this is the biggest lack of respect that you can give somebody because that means you can't control your emotions. And then that's when I become volatile and then I'm going to help you control them. You understand what I'm saying? Because if you can't control them on your own accord mm -hmm. and, and people treat people the way they think they can treat them. See, this, this, this is me with my psychological shit what I took in hunt to what you know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't talk to the drug dealer on the corner and raise your voice at him because you know he'll hurt you. So don't think you can raise your voice at me because I'm I'm your significant other or, or I'm your son or I'm your cousin or whatever. Because if people started whipping other people ass for asses for shit that they thought they they couldn't get away with, there'd be a whole lot of different respect given out. I say all that to say, I saw not such a great marital relationship. I knew either there was going to be two things that happened. Either I was going to, like, as, as Prince said, maybe you're going to be just like your father. That wasn't going to happen because I didn't appreciate that. Or I was going to change that and be a better man to where I'm never going to touch a woman. You understand what I'm saying? So we, we have choices in life. You can succumb to the, the, to the BS and say, this is why I'm this way I am. Or you can change and say, listen, I'm never going to be that way. You know? It's like a person brought up in poverty. You don't have to be a product of your environment. And the same thing with rich people. Just because you get all this money, you don't have to be a spoil ass brat. So yeah. we, 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 we pick up we pick poison. Go ahead, Lisa, please. But just like trying to make it to the NBA, right? A lot of people get cut. They make it, you know, and there's a lot of us who get cut and we don't Listen. we don't make it where we need to be where the, the, to the level of stability where we need to be okay Lisa, Lisa, i've let, had let me, let, me Lisa, let me just say this let me interject i apologize but please let me interject norman and i play college ball together right norman went overseas and played professionally i graduated the year of the guard i graduated mm -hmm. with olden polynese i graduated uh, kenny smith pearl washington uh, Mark Jackson, I got, listen, not even close to wearing their shoes, right? But I was, I, maybe the average cat on the street, I can give him the business. Did it crush me that I didn't make the pros? Did it crush Norman that he made the pros? Maybe, maybe not. Norman is 6'8". You know, he played against how many professional? He played professional. But the bottom line is, there's another way and there's another how. So, you know, I didn't, let me tell you something. The, there was a time in my life when I was 13 years old, my grandmother passed away. And when, before she passed away, right before she was passed away, my father beat me and he used to always say, don't cry. I'll give you something to cry about, right? So I was taught never to cry. Mm -hmm. When my grandmother passed away, I was so messed up in the head when they went to go view the body and I felt like I wanted to cry, I sat back down because I didn't want to cry. For 18 years, I did not cry until my father passed away. Everybody out there, you do the math. 13 to eight and 18 years. 30 some years old until my father passed away. When my father passed away, I cried like a baby countless times. 
because the she everything was just let go. So I get it. I get it. We're made different. We're built different. We all are. And and we have to deal with our own demons. I call them demons. Some people may not call them demons. Some people may call them issues. Some people may call them just whatever. We all, everybody in life has issues. And this is what real talk is about. It's about getting that off your chest, getting that monkey, donkey, skunk, whatever it is to help you be able to sleep a better day, to see tomorrow. I try to give positive affirmation as much as I can because there's so much negativity in the world. People will try to do everything to take advantage of you, say so much disrespectful shit, talk about your hair, your lips, your eyes, your ass, your stomach. What is going on? We are so disrespectful to each other. How do we expect somebody else to treat us good? But the one thing is, you like need, I you all, I'm going to let you say, but like, like I say all the time, I look in that mirror and I will, anybody that knows me, Norm knows my my, my nickname, b Fluff. I'm always going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be cute, handsome, no matter what. And I don't care anybody. You, you ain't nobody going to tell me that I ain't fly. No one. <laughs> so I say all that to say, you got to love yourself before anybody else can love you. Go ahead, Norm. One thing about it, though, B, you, you're so right. It starts with yourself. When I got married to my wife some 20 whatever years ago, we sat down and I told her, I'm not going to fuss with you. I'm not going to fight you. Don't put your hands on me. I'm not going to put my hands on you. We had one I guess you could say argument, disagreement, whatever, in the 20 something years. Right, just right. one where voices were raised. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know something? We could have sat down at the table and had a drink and discussed this shit. <laughs> I don't fuss. I'm not going to fuss with you. You want to fuss? You go ahead. I'll be back when you finish. It exactly. takes two fools to fuss. I'm not a fool. But we got to have more, we got to instill in our people. Children, people of color, we got to instill in each other that we are worth it. We are somebody. We're not niggas and hoes. No, no. We we are worth it, and, and we got away from that. When did we stop? When did, did I saw pictures back when I was growing up where I had on a shirt and tie, and I'm like, why am I wearing a shirt and tie? I'm supposed to have on jeans and some sneakers and some. It's because of the culture we were raised in, where we took pride in the way we dressed. We took pride in, in the way we we may not have but a but a one pot meal at home, but you would never know that. These kids nowadays are so spoiled that they think they're entitled. So when they don't get their way, first thing they holler, my mental health. My mental health. I'm looking at that kid from the NBA. Uh, I just thought of his name, but I forgot it that quick. Who was playing with the 76ers, and now he's over at Brooklyn. Oh, and he said that his mental yeah. health. Yeah, his mental health. His mental health. It's not mental. You don't want to play. That's it. Just say, just be honest with it and say you don't want to play. Don't use that because when somebody else comes with a mental health issue, they're not going to be be open to it. So somebody that says that claim mental health can mess it up for the people coming behind them. Absolutely. Same thing when I did re-entry. When I when you open the door for that person, the person got to open the door for the person behind them. Don't shut it. And and so I get tired of hearing, oh well, you know, mental illness, mental illness. It's not always an excuse, and it can't be used as an excuse. We need to start saying, taking accountability for ourselves and say, I just did that. I fucked up. Yeah. That was absolutely. my bad. Absolutely. You know, the consequences are not as big. You know, you, you know, your parents always say, well, I'd rather for you to tell me the truth than lie to me because you lie to me is even worse. Absolutely. So just say, yo, I messed up. You know, let's see what I can do to, to rectify the situation and we move on. But to say, oh, I got a mental health issue because I was. My mama didn't let me use the internet when I was younger. Come on, knock come on, it off. Lose me with that shit. Absolutely. You know, Lisa, I'm gonna let you come in. Hold yeah. on, Norm. I just want to read some comments. Yeah. From, from everybody, okay. everybody. Real Talk Chronicles. 
I'm your host, Bill Forster. This is Real Talk with Dr. Marilyn Corder. I love the comments and stuff. I'm going to read them, and then I'm going to let Lisa chime in. Uh, I got my special guest, Lisa Weissside, and my special guest, Norman Davis. We're having Real Talk on a mental aspect, how we get to the place we are, and how can we get away from the places that we've been. You know, demons, dark sides, whatever you want to call them. What are you going to do to help you become a better person? Because the bottom line is, we can't help if we can't we can't help anybody else unless we help ourselves, and that's 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 real talk. Like that, we need to help ourselves become better people. I hope this show touches people. I hope it listens. Who people listen? Please, if you if if you're my friend on Facebook, share it. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to it because I just try to give positive affirmation. I just want to read some comments and statements, and then Lisa, you can chime in and Norm. We, we, we continue. And, and shout out to Lisa. I'm a savior. Lisa, you, you said well, we definitely got to reach out to each other. You're so right. Lisa, you and I spend so many times hanging out together, uh, socializing, and we, and we don't call and check in on each other and say hello. I, my, I'll i take half ownership of that. You take half ownership. And I say that to anybody that's watching. We need to reach out and just text somebody if you can't say, hey, what's up? I mean, call them. There's certain people that may need us more than others. But, but we use social media as a guide to say, oh, he's all right. I just saw him at this place. He tagged himself in or he was this way. Sometimes what happens to just picking up the phone and say, hey, how you doing? I love you. I miss you. Anybody that knows that most of the time if I talk to you, we have some kind of history and longevity. I will always usually say when we get off the phone, I say I love you because we've been through a lot. And I do. You understand what I'm saying? So that's the things that we have to do and, and, and stay in touch with each other. I just want to read some comments. My man Mark said, he said, Bill, this is such a deep discussion. Looks also play a part in something internal with some of us. The world is the world, the world is and can be cruel. Confidence is self in, in itself is important. Learning how to navigate um navigate is the key. Please let it be clear. I'm not saying mental issues issues are not a problem and haven't been the support to help. Tracy, she said, uh, Tracy Morton Gordon. She said, this conversation is so powerful. I too was beaten without my clothes on by my stepfather as a mother stood, as my mother stood by and said, I deserved it. I wasn't a bad child, so I didn't deserve, understand it. As a result of something in the past, my memory is limited. And what I've decided to seek help, I was told to think about. Do I really want to find out what happened? Absolutely. Angel Ray said, breaking this cycle uh, that we saw as children and determine what we can do better. Absolutely. Shout out to Rudy. I see you in here. Uh, Colin said, I'm crying watching the news. If you have a funeral and no one to cry, call me. Uh, Prince, my man said, great conversation. Teaching self-love is a value. Absolutely. Kimberly Scarborough, she said, beautifully said, amen. Uh, Stefania said, as a community, many of us need therapy. Absolutely. Marks, uh, Rose Mark said, Norm and Bill, this attitude of entitlement is, is encouraged by our society. Soft and not disciplined. Parents have to stop making it easy for their kids. Let them feel the struggle, not kept, uh, keep them away uh, from it. Exactly. Just I'm, I'm going to read some more real quick. But also, how do you get a a, a, a a trophy for coming in eighth place? Norman, you and I ain't never heard no shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, kids get trophies now for coming in eighth place. Listen, it was one to four. After that, knock it off, B. You lost. Now, hold on, on. let me just finish reading some more comments. It's not, I'm trying to acknowledge the people that are in here. Sharon Klesko, she said, my, my community helped me. My teachers, my music teacher, and my neighbors helped me with my hair when my when my check out of life. A community can help raise a child. Absolutely. Sharon also says, I also had a mother who had a problem with emotions, which was different, difficult for me as an only mm -hmm. child. She also beat beat you for anything that bothered her. Yeah, there was no father. I didn't even know uh, what, what he looked like. I understand where you are coming from, Lisa. Nay said, there's a, a book that's called A Traumatic Slave Syndrome. It touches everything that was discussed tonight and how it has it is learned behavior. It's really a good read. Angel Ray said, you have to know your child and what discipline works for them. For me, getting a, a beating work, what but but uh, but my siblings needed a different approach. Prin Princella said, I so, I so agree with Norman. Men don't know how to express their feelings. 
It's irritating. It's like trying to speak to someone with a language barrier. Uh, Stefania says that um, a lot of people are broken and unhealed, and instead of getting their mind right and getting therapy, they go and have kids and continue the vicious cycle. Absolutely. Everybody, this is Real Talk Chronicles. I'm your host, Bill Forza, with my co-host, Dr. Marilyn Quarter. This is Real Talk with Dr. Quarter. We are talking about mental illness and mental health and what can we do to become better people. And I have my special panel of, of people that uh, are helping me along this conversation, Ms. Lisa Whiteside and Mr. Norman Davis. Lisa is a retired correction officer and an educator, and Norman has was a retired law enforcement out of uh, the North Carolina area, and he has also done his part to help educate and, and, and teach the children. Um, Norman, you were going to say something, and Lisa, go ahead, please continue. Go ahead, Norm. And then yeah. Um, you know, one thing about people, when you're looking at someone, the first thing you see is their appearance. That's what attracts us to a person, is, is their physical. And you don't know their mental. Now, when we were in high school and even college, we were always said the girls that had the good sex were crazy because the sex was so good. And it was a it was taken as a joke. But a lot of it was true. They had low self-esteem. They didn't have mm -hmm. the father figure to show them what a man is supposed to treat them like. And mm -hmm. it's, it's like, like uh, one of the uh, viewers said, it's a recurring cycle that, that needs to be broken and it starts in the home. So when I had children, my first children were twin girls. So I said, I must have really been doing something bad to get twin girls. And I had to show them how to go on, how, how a man's supposed to treat them when they go on a date, how a man's supposed to treat them when they're talking to them. Powerful. I never put my hands on my daughters. I never put my hands on my daughters. And I told them, I don't want you getting used to a man putting his hands on you. If I don't do it, you don't let no other man do it. So it's a learned behavior that is easily to be broken, but we just have to do the work to break it. Um, but nowadays, we're so scared to speak to other people. Children, are we so scared to speak to other people? That, that, that you know, you can't really have any say in, in things. So it, it, these um, suicide prevention hotline, these help, help hotlines, People are not really getting to know the person they're speaking to um, because you really can't get to know a person over the phone. You have to do it in person. And you know what's so funny, Norm? It's so funny. I'm going to bring Lisa in on this, but it's so funny. The people that hurt us, we can't talk to because they don't want to hear what the problem is because they're the ones that hurt yes. us. They ain't going to understand it because if I tell you what you did, you're going to, you're going to, you know, they reply, they, they, they reply because of what they heard, they don't reply because they understand what I said or what we said. And the thing is, we feel funny talking to somebody on the phone because you don't know. And then you start psychoanalyzing me. I don't want that. Sometimes we just need an ear just to listen to what I got to say or a shoulder to cry on. Please, people, out yes. there, be more sympathetic to the people that you say you love. Because mm -hmm. if you can say the ones that you love, then we can start dealing with the other people that we don't know. But we can't, we can't, if we can't save ourselves, how the hell are we going to try to save somebody else? I see a lot of people going through a lot of shit and, but they, they're good at solving somebody else's problem, but they live, they're living in a world of chaos. You know what I'm saying? Lisa, your thoughts, comments, this? Well, I think that so much was explored this evening. We have to do this again. Hopefully I'm begging you, you know, and break it down into little pieces and morsels and trying mm -hmm. to tackle some of these issues that we're experiencing as a race in the yes. black community, how we should strive to build better relationships. Like you said, you tell people you love them, you know, you, you try to avoid the discord that you know exists within our community, you know, and you give people that thing, that nudge that they need 
in order to feel good about themselves. And collectively, we don't do that well. You said the same thing, but I think you said it differently, but we don't love each other well. Right, right, we right. don't respect one another the way that we should, you know? Um, I, I'm a dark-skinned woman, okay? Still, in this day and age, dark-skinned women are, are not popular. You know, a friend of mine, and he's a very close friend of mine, um, and we're very candid with one another. And he said to me, you know what? Back in the day, I would have never talked to you. You know, we call girls like you a booger. And stuff. I'm like, really? You know? Mm. But he's being honest. He's being honest. That's his story. You know? Let, That's can, I, can I say something? Can I? Can I say something? And, and I don't know your friend, and I and and that's your two conversation, but 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 when I right. say, when, listen, in my mind, ain't nobody prettier than me, right? <laughs> let, let me tell you, like Norm said earlier, listen, I I I don't, I don't know, I, listen, I I didn't get that name B Fly for nothing. So I say that, and I've never mm -hmm. told a woman that. But listen, if 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 you carried yourself ugly. Then you were ugly. We also know about the dark skin, light skin situation. Uh, the white woman, okay. this and that, and the Latin. So, so you know what's so funny? I listen. There's a woman on news on the sports news today. I think uh, what is her name? McNutt. Uh, oh my God, I just forgot her first name. Uh, she used to play for Georgetown. She's a newscaster. I think Monica Mc, uh, McNutt. Uh, if that's her, her, I'm pronouncing her last name. Malika and I said, "Yo, for a Brownson, Brownson was Brownson sister. She wears her hair short. She doesn't have the fake this, doesn't have the fake that. And I think she is so beautiful. And Malika and I both talk about, oh, look, like like that's a real good positive sister right there. So you have people have to love themselves. Yeah, we've been taught light skin, long hair, right? But now everybody wear weave. Malika, tell you." I don't, I don't date women with weaves. I don't date women with false eyelashes. If you fake, I, I it, it didn't happen. I want an all natural. I'd rather have a dog skin woman with a short, kinkly afro or curl or, or afro and, and 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 just her beautiful skin than a, a light skin woman with a weave down her back and, and false eyelashes. It's not happening. I tell my wife all the time, I love her short haircut. You know what I'm saying? I love her. I, I tell her when we got together, I said, yo. It's what attracted me to you. You see what I'm saying? So for him to tell you that tells me more about him and not you. You understand what I'm saying? And, and if he's listening now, it's what I said. I, I didn't back back away from it because the bottom line is I've never called a dog skin woman a booker. I've never. And let me tell you something. I put my record against a lot of men. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? And I've never disrespected a woman like that. And I don't say that. I don't, I don't wear getting women... As a badge of honor, but I'm just saying, there's certain things in life that have become mm -hmm. easy. You understand what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. this, this, every man can mm -hmm. get a woman, but can you get a woman that that, that you want to mm -hmm. be with? I didn't get married until I got late in my life because I kissed a lot of frogs and I thought they were going to turn into princesses, and they did. You know what I'm saying? They still jumping mm -hmm. in the sewer. So <laughs> a lot of fictitious people in this world, a lot of cosmetic, a lot of mm -hmm. commercial. So. I am where I'm supposed to be, and I and I'm so happy where I'm at right now. If if, if anybody you see how Malika and I inter you know inter interact with each other, you can see it's genuine love. All that I'm saying is that we could talk about light skin, dark skin. We could talk about this. We could talk about that. It is what it is. But if you look at yourself as ugly, well, I wanted to tell ugly, one more story. Okay, go ahead. Tell you one more story. Go ahead. Uh huh. No, and I said it before I, I I started it, and then you know, but um, in terms of what goes on in your household and how you learn to be the person that you are, and um, I, I was in a relationship with someone who was very very nice to me, very nice, and I was exceptionally disrespectful, so much. I, I I had to go into therapy. I said, Let's see a therapist because I need to better understand why I did the things I did. Um, and 
Davis, once he dissected it all, he says that because domestic abuse was in my household when I was growing up, I never wanted to become a victim of domestic violence. So I sided with the abuser. I sided with the abuser. And I, I never would have made that connection. Um, so I was told that whenever someone weak comes into my space, I will eat them. I would eat them. Now, had I not going, gone into therapy to understand where this behavior was coming from, I, I don't know what could have happened to me in my life. You know, well, and well, I'm Lisa, saying I, that to I, say I that. I think we all know that we all need therapy. Mm -hmm. we, we, all, we all need therapy, even to this day. We all do. And no one, no one is exempt from... from some having therapy. I think the problem is we feel that we don't have anybody in our lives that we respect. We're so busy worrying about because we all we probably all been burnt. If I tell one person this, oh, he gonna go back and tell her, or he gonna tell him. So I don't want my business out in the street. And we still bottled in the side. Let me tell you something. I learned a long time ago that if you keep talking to yourself, you're only talking to a fool. You understand what I'm saying? We need to we need to talk to somebody else that's gonna enlighten us. That's why when I made that declaration to Norman, I told him that. I said, listen, we will always be together. You know, if and 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 sometimes it's not about giving advice. If Norman called me and, and he says, yo, I just need to talk, then that means that's my job to listen. It's not my job to give advice. Some of okay. us try to give advice and we right. don't know a, a we don't have a pot to piss in and a window to throw it out of. A person with no money can't tell right. me how to make money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm gonna talk to a millionaire about making some money, but I'm not talking to the cat on the corner that's talking about, can you give me a dollar? And you know, it's so funny when cats are in the corner talking about, yo, can I borrow money? I hit them with, can I? I was about to ask you, can I borrow some money? And they was like, well, I need this to make a whole dollar. I said, well, I need that to make a whole dollar. So now we stand in there at a, a crossroads because if you really want something to eat, I'll give you something to eat. I'll take you to buy you something to eat. But I'm not giving no grown ass man no money. That's not happening on my watch, and that's a whole nother topic. So what my my I'm gonna change pass it to Norman, and then I'm gonna bring it back. But I just want to read some comments. Lisa, we all need therapy, all of us. Yeah, we have, we have so many, and I use the word. That's a comment, or that's you? That's me talking. We have so what, what we I think we all oh, have. Okay. Need. No, I'm saying we all need therapy. I mean, listen. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we start chopping down that bridges, we got to start talking, chopping down those bridges to get to, you know, a better place. And if you don't think you you have problems, you have problems because sometimes in conversing with people, you can hear somebody talk mm -hmm. about something and you can be like, yo, they got issues. And and, and they unknown right. to them, their dialect will lead you to bad, you know, bad energy. I, like, I don't want to be around nobody with bad energy. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just read some comments and then I'm going to let you and Norm close us out before we get out of here. Um, Tracy said, in regards to spanking, beating children, I recommend the books uh, Spare the Kids While Whooping Children Won't Save Black Black America by Stacey Payton. Nate, Nate Crawford, my man, he said, um, he said, I never put my hands on my daughter. I've always told her not to, not men, not no man would ever love her Okay, let me see if I get this right. Nate Crawford said, I've never put my hands on my daughter. I've always told her not man will ever love you more than I do because I would give you my life so you you won't feel any pain. If I don't put my hands on you, no man should be able to beat you and say that he loves you. Respect. Tracy, Tracy Morton Gordon, she says, yes, Bill. Uh, true, they don't want to hear it. My mother says I did the best I could, could and I asked for you. And I ask for your forgiveness. Then starts talking about her childhood. Mother-daughter relationships are very difficult. Yes. What's up, uh, Finlayson, Tommy? Uh, my man Lucky said, Bill Forster. Hi, Finlayson. Uh, he said, Lucky said, I love the show. Angel Ray is in the building. 
My man Roderick Childress is in the building. So you, you know what's so funny? Everybody, yeah, we 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 will continue this discussion another day on 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 mental health, mental mental care. Um, a lot of times it's great to have a, a clinical person or, that has all the credentials in the world, but who knows if they effed up? You know what I'm saying? I I know some clinical people. They can't tell me shit. Because I know their background. They back crazy. And, and I wouldn't listen to a damn thing they say. And I'll say it to their face. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying half the battle is just telling mm -hmm. them the truth. You couldn't tell me shit. And if they're listening now, you know who I'm talking about. You still can't tell me shit. So the bottom line is we need to talk to people that we respect their opinion. This is this is my this is my remedy. Mm -hmm. You need to talk to people that you respect their opinion. You need to talk to people that will uplift you and motivate you. You know, talk to people that will help you off that ledge and not put you on that ledge. A lot of us, we talk to the to the, the problem. The problem ain't helping us. The problem's going to tell us we're the problem. Nah, we ain't the problem, yo. We just want to be solved. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, I'm going to let you go first. Mm -hmm. Give us some positive affirmation. Give us some thoughts and comments. You got three minutes, and then I'm going to pass it to Norman, and then we're going to close it out. I everybody, this is Real Talk Chronicles. I'm your host, Bill Forster. I appreciate you all. Don't leave. Let these people give their, their, give their uh, affirmations and, and their positive thoughts and, and feelings on whatever they transfer tonight. Thank you so much for being here, Lisa. Go ahead, please. Well, um, I thank you for having me. I mean, this to me tonight was extremely powerful, you know, that we can sit and have dialogue like this about some of the challenges, the good and the bad, um, that we've experienced in our life. Um, affirmation, love. I just would like to, you know, emphasize the importance of loving one another, um, complimenting one another, being more sensitive to the way other people, like you said, you, you do these positive, you make positive comments um, to people. Um, we need to do more of that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm no, kind of, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, let's I'm at least I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt you. If you're not finished, let me know when you're finished. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. If I have no, to I, add something, I'll do so once Norman is finished, but no, no, I okay. think I just have a lot of stuff dry, gyrating in my mind tonight at this point. So it's hard to just encapsulate um, something that I really want to put forth. I, it's not clicking because all the stuff that we've talked about this evening is mm -hmm. still in my head. Just dance now. Can, can you do me a favor? I mean, can I you go back in, in, into the chat? Me. Can you go back into the chat and write in? Because when you write in the chat, all the people that have watched and saw this will read your comments and statements. And you may just want to spew stuff out. And sometimes what you have to say doesn't need a response. So I think that's a beautiful thing about mm -hmm. being a good listener and, and, and a friend as we'll develop our relationship mm -hmm. that to let somebody talk and, and let them just talk. Because sometimes people want to talk because nobody's ever listened to them. So the bottom line is what you write, writing is a form sometimes... <laughs> Writing is the best form of, of, of communication. So I just wanted to say that because the bottom line, and also Lisa, go, go to my Facebook page and share it to your Facebook page so your people can listen to it. You do the same thing, Norm. Norm, but give me some positive love and affirmation. And I'm only saying that due to time restraints, Lisa. And can so I just ahead, say Norm. to you, I just want to say to you, Bill, really quick, that please don't think that I'm being decisive because I keep looking at my biggest screen instead of looking this way so sometimes you know throughout the evening i've been like this because i have a screen next to me and it's been a distraction no not at all because you know what's so funny i always apologize because a lot of times i i, I reply to people as they chime in 
and, and talk to me. So I looked down and I looked at mm-hmm. two different monitors and stuff like that. So I, I have all these t- forms of communication that I, I that I I I, mm-hmm. I I reply on and talk to. So I multitask to the best of right. my ability. So I apologize sometimes if I don't make eye contact. So trust me, I don't take it personal. Let me let me give it, let me give the form for the norm. Go ahead, Norm. Okay, thank you. But I appreciate you for having me, my brother. Mm-hmm. I look forward to doing it again. Absolutely. I enjoyed the co. Um, I will say this: we need to start loving each other like we did before. We need to realize that we're not bitches and hoes and niggas and niggers and all that stuff. Yep. We need to realize that even the strongest person needs a shoulder to lean on. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody, this is Real Talk Chronicles. Okay. I see Mika. I, I found see you the in comment. The... Okay, go ahead. I found <laughs> the comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was listening to Norman. Norman, thank you so much. I meant to tell you that earlier. Thank you for sharing yourself. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, it definitely meant a lot to me. And lastly, um, see, you made me forget what I was going to say, Bill. And stuff, but we need to be more honest, you know. We need to share our stories and and, and be honest. Um, just because we don't see a therapist, it doesn't mean that we can't heal in the village. We can feel we can heal within the village. I'll end on that note. Thank you, Thank Bill. You. Thank, Thank you, you Norman. Everybody. Everybody, this is Real Talk Chronicles. I just want to read Mark's uh, comment. He said, much and mad respect to Norm and Lisa. This is another show that, that forces deep thought. Thank you. I appreciate that. Everybody, I appreciate all the comments and the questions. Please, uh, Norm, Lisa, share it to your page. Go to my Facebook page and share it to your page. And then I implore you to go back into the comments and read them and converse with the people that have commented and questioned and said things about you, kind and in, 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 in sympathetic ears. Uh, Tracy said, I thank you all for your transparency, for having the willingness to share your experiences. Sammy Maldonado, I see you, brother. We about to get out of here. Everybody, if you're on Facebook, share it. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to it. Tell a friend, tell a foe. Real Talk Chronicles, Bill. Sponsors, Melba, Leon Ellis, uh, 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 Delhi Arts Magazine, Soft Illusions. Listen, I'm just a brother just trying to make it happen, man. I'm just trying to have real talk. To all my real talk listeners, my real talk family, I appreciate you. I love you. We are out of here. You guys hold on for a second. We're about to get out of here. Vivian, I see you. Look at the uh, the replay of Real Talk. Hold on, you two.